Okay, ladies and gentlemen, all over the world, welcome back again to a very interesting session. I'm going to say that in this particular one, it's going to be virtually moderated by all the team. They're scattered all around the world and they're going to have a very good time. So, um, Mr. Lombe, I'll give you your panel and then you take it on, have an amazing time, and then I'll come back later and then we'll close out that session um, to wrap up this year's Ghana Green Building Summit. So please take it on. Dumbe, I'm literally walking off the stage now. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I suppose this is uh, part of the new world order that we are, that we're currently living in, that everything is, um, is virtual. Um, so today's uh, topic that we'll be discussing is, uh, net, is net zero buildings. Uh, we've got a quite an interesting panel of, of, of people um, because it's quite a, a new, it's quite a, a new and stringent uh, environmental goal for um, many, many different um, markets. Uh, we've got a lot of, we've got some people here with um, experience in, in delivering and in markets where this is happening. And then also uh, myself, I'm based in, in South Africa and then Pauline is uh, based in Ghana. So some local flavor to the mix uh, as well. Um, I'm going to let everybody present and uh, introduce themselves during their, their presentation. So the format will be that we'll have a short presentation from each person. We'll learn what net zero buildings are. And then hopefully I will help to ask some of the questions that we, we, all, we all have. So um, in terms of the order that we were going to go in, I think uh, Salome was going to go first. Um, I'm not sure if all the... Uh, if all the permissions around uh, presenting have been done, or if we are presenting from 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 our own, but I'm I'm assuming Salome is going to tell us just now whether it's working. Are you still on mute? Yes, sorry. Good. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I will be sharing my own screen. So give me one second, please. Perfect. And Salome, we'll let you go through your entire presentation and then as questions come in, we'll have a couple of uh, Q&A and then we'll carry on to the next one. Are you, uh, are you able to see? Not yet. Mm. Nothing yet? I think something is coming up now. There we go. Okay. Okay, you can see? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right, um, good morning, good afternoon. I know we are all over the world. Uh, my name is Salome Gerba. I am currently as uh, you know, working with um, BC Sustainable Energy Utility. We are um, the lo local for you know, Washington DC. We provide um, financial and technical assistance for any businesses or residents that want to invest in energy efficiency. Uh, a little bit about my background, uh, by training, I'm a mechanical engineer. I've worked in the HVAC in industry at you know, different capacities from engineering to design to uh, project management um, for about 10 years. And beyond that, I have now transitioned into, um, for the past few years, into energy, specifically energy efficiency in the commercial um, space. Uh, prior to my time at, you know, my current role at BC Sustainable Energy Utility, I was with Department of um, Energy, the U.S. Government Department of Energy, um, uh, you know, heading the program for specifically for our net zero um, buildings. So, and today my presentation is basically um, a little bit of an overview of net zero buildings, specifically in the United States, but I'll touch a little bit about how it relates to uh, Africa, seeing that we are, you know, um, doing a presentation, in, um, you know, in Ghana about buildings, you know, the Ghana Green Building Summit. So let's, let me quickly go through the slides. And if you have any questions, please feel free uh, to ask later on. So 
um, you know, I'm sure all of us here, you know, those of us that are interested in green buildings, we have heard about net zero by 2050. And this is um, kind of driven by, you know, the International Energy Agency. And their goal, you know, is to get us to net zero by 2050. This is an extremely ambitious goal. But the idea is to avoid the worst impacts of, you know, the climate change, which really, as part of the Paris Agreement, is to keep global warming within the 1.5 degrees Celsius pre-industrial um, levels. Um, so with that in mind, um, to kind of bring it um, in towards Africa is 49 of the 54 African countries have signed on to this 2015 Paris Agreement. And some have joined the zero carbon emissions, specifically South Africa, for example. Um, again, we realize this is a very ambitious goal uh, for South, you know, for any you know country, let alone you know those in the developing nation. So we talk about net zero, but what exactly is a net zero building? Um, a net zero building is um, an you know energy efficient building where on a source energy basis, the actual annual delivered energy is less or equal to the on-site renewable energy. Basically, it's whatever you're consuming and whatever you're producing, it's a balance. But how do we go about achieving this? So the first one, let's talk about, you know, consumption. You know, any building, whether it's in the US or um, Ghana, Africa, th throughout the world, we have lighting, we have, you know, our cooling and heating needs, we have hot water, we have fans, pumps, you know, different appliances, phone charging, you know, uh, uh, computers, a bunch of um, appliances that go into our household. So that goes as part of our consumption. And then, so how do we now balance what we are consuming? And then we also, you know, need to add on any renewable energy to our um, production in terms of utility. So a building on a diet you know, think about our own bodies and a diet as well. So that is what you're consuming and what you're producing is balanced. So again, keep in mind, this is on an annual uh, basis. Uh, you know, uh, for example, your production could be higher at summertime and a much lower on wintertime. So it's annually calculated. And so, it's, and to achieve this, the first thing you have to do again, as you can see is, the first one is energy efficiency. You know, you have to have energy, an energy efficient building and energy efficient systems, um, consistent operation and maintenance, and then change in user behavior also all comes into the consumption part of, you know, getting to zero basically. And so to achieve this, we have to have at least about 50 to 70% reduction from standard buildings that, you know, exist today without, you know, the energy, without the net zero concept behind it. And then secondly is when you apply on-site renewable energy. In most cases within the US, this has been uh, mostly solar. And again, this concept can be enlarged through, you know, a country or a region, you know, depending on, but right now we're focusing on buildings. So it's whatever you're producing on your building in, compar in comparison to what you're consuming. So that is the definition of what a net and a zero building is. So what is, I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, my focus um, earlier when I worked with Department of Energy was specifically zero energy. And um, the US has a zero energy now uh, mission. Um, and so that mission is to basically accelerate the development of zero energy commercial buildings, specifically those, the space that I was working on. But we also have retail office buildings, um, you know, residential as well. And to make sure that we are providing as a federal government that we are providing the technical assistance and, you know, the operations, construction, design, all of those to be able to deliver, um, you know, a zero energy building. The terms zero energy, actually US federal government uses the term zero energy. They are interchangeable in the US between net zero and US and zero energy. So if I say those things, please understand that we mean um, the same thing. So, um, oh, let me go back a little bit. And so we decided um, to focus, you know, by we, I mean US government, uh, decided to focus specifically initially on schools and I'll explain why. Um, in the US, there are about 130,000 K-12 schools, which host about 55 million students and 3.8 million teachers. 
that makes it the large, the third largest subsector of commercial buildings um, and in terms of energy use. In addition, um, you know, it costs about six billion a year annually, second to salaries, you know, in terms of you know the money spent by schools um, in the US. So it is a huge uh, undertaking, you know, utility costs are a huge undertaking for our school, you know, districts. In addition, there's about at least 14 billion, and this was um, this is not including the new uh, funding that is um, set by this new administration, the Biden administration. There's probably a lot more, but at least there's 14 billion in new construction. So if we are already investing in new construction, we might as well start net zero. Um, and then there's strong uh, stakeholder involvement. Anytime a school is um, about to be built or added, there's a large community involvement, at least within the US um, system. Um, you know, there are school boards, there is community organizations that make decisions around this um, school. And again, as, uh, as a whole, schools tend to be pillars to the community. Um, in addition, they are excellent replication model potentials. Uh, market and then market. What better way to do market transformation through new generational education? If you end up going to a net zero school, the idea of you learning about net zero, you, you being able to touch this renewable um, energy, like as you can see in the picture, that, that is a school where you know the kids get to play with the solar energy, really learn firsthand how the, these buildings operate, and then through energy efficiency, the cost of the energy um, reduced can provide much needed funds for other schools and programs. For, so for all those reasons, we thought, you know, schools are one of the first places to start investing. And so um, this again was about eight or nine years ago. Um, so what were the challenges back then? Again, of course, these challenges still exist. You don't change, you know, the market in a you know, few years. But so we decided to first identify what are our barriers and then what are the strategies. So with that, we said, um, you know, the first one is lack of reliable information on how much it costs to build these buildings, so, you know, lack of technical knowledge, um, you know, net zero investments perceived to be too expensive. That's always been the case. Um, you know, a school board, when they meet together to decide to build on a new school, do they even know what a net zero means? You know, there. If you're not actively involved in the energy industry, these are not terms that you are familiar with. So, you know, there's a lack of education in that space, and then a lack of integration between designers and school administrators. School administrators make decision in a silo outside of this designers. Yes, designers might know about net zero, but again, there is that lack of um, education uh, with, and then we need to bridge the gap with the school administrators. So, a few of the strategies that we came up with is the first one is you know, providing access to the feasibility study. The US with the help of the National Renewable Energy, uh, National Renewable uh, Laboratory, NREL, um, did a feasible study, a feasibility study. And we found that cost to cost, you're able to build a zero energy and net zero building school, um, whether you live in the coldest part of the country or, you know, the warmest uh, part of the country you're able to build. And so this very highly technical study is available. Anyone can Google and be able to find it, but we are also uh, placing it as a, a resource for our schools. Technical design and strategies, this goes as part of our feasibility study, but it shows case studies on exactly how to build technical designs. And we have a, you know published a book on how to go about this, how to talk to your stakeholders, how to make decisions around um, actually building a zero energy school. And in addition, um, there is what was called a zero energy schools accelerator, which I was actually leading. And this accelerator is basically creating a platform um, for like-minded school districts to get together, those that want to build net zero, to learn from each other, to get the support that they need, um, set them up with the proper engineers and designers so that it's easier for them to achieve net zero. Once doing all of that, um, currently the, uh, the US, as a result of all the effort that was done, 34% of all net zero buildings are in the educational space, which is the largest um, market to hold you know, in the net zero space. Um, and then, so right now we have about 189 emerging and 50 verified. Uh, the verified means annually, you know, their data has been uh, computed and verified by NBI. Uh, you will hear from, you know, one of our, my fellow panelists. Uh, he is Alexi from NBI. And this data that you'll see, the map that you'll see is from coast to coast. We have been able to 
uh, build net zero schools within the United States. And bringing the focus in a little bit narrower to Washington DC where I reside, um, you know, so DC has very ambitious goals to be, you know, this, and, you know, in terms of sustainability to be the healthiest, greenest city in the US by 2032, which includes reducing greenhouse gas emissions and energy use by 50%. And one of the ways to do this is through, you know, uh, focusing on net zero buildings. Uh, so, you know, the Washington DC Net Zero Program is a, a collaborative program with DCRA. Is our DCRA is our local Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, which basically is in charge of enforcing building codes, providing building permits, issue business licenses are, you know, one of some of the few things that they do. So we, by we, I mean the DC Sustainable Energy Utility, we work together. Um, we are also an extension of the local DC government. So we work together in providing guidance to help property owners and developers to go from design to occupancy. Um, it's a volunteer program. All building types, residential as well as commercial, in any size can apply. And DCRS um, assistance is technical assistance as well as expediting permitting. If you know anything about building a building within the US, Permitting is one of the biggest headaches. It costs a lot of money, it costs a lot of time. The process is uh, very tedious. But if you are you know, interested in building net zero program, DCRA themselves are you know, um, expediting the permitting as well as DCSU providing your financial and technical assistance. So with this program, we have been able to achieve about 10 emerging um, you know, uh, zero, net zero uh, buildings in Washington DC, which includes schools, recreation centers, commercial buildings. The building that you actually see is the American Geophysical Union building. It's one of the newest zero energy commercial. It's an office building. Um, it's about five uh, floors. If you are ever in Washington DC, I highly recommend um, you know, for you to get a chance, if you get a chance to visit this building, they do give tours regularly. Um, it's uh, an amazing building from all the different technologies that they used to be able to achieve um, the net zero status. So, um, Again, while you know, big strides are being made to improve uh, you know, the net zero buildings, the number of net zero buildings, there are still a lot of challenges. Um, fear that net zero buildings will be too expensive. Again, this is always a concept, even though there are case studies where you know, the cost has not been significantly higher, um, that is still you know, a myth that's out there. Risk of new technologies, cost, time, underperformance, you know, uh, there is this idea where maybe they're not giving us enough windows or maybe too much windows. So now it's too hot in there, you know, so, but no, these buildings are designed in, with, you know, health and safety of the occupants in mind and are, you know, in fact, operate exceptionally uh, better than standard buildings. Risk that building do not perform as designed. I just mentioned that again. Uh, fear of occupants will be less satisfied. Uh, again, you know, I just mentioned, you know, folks thinking that they're not getting enough AC or enough heating just to be able to save energy. And that, in fact, is not the case because there are technological advances that have been made that, you know, you're able to get enough of either your heating or your cooling needs without having to consume as much energy. And then, of course, workforce is a big deal, um, you know, making sure our building operators know exactly how to operate them. And this is, needs to go hand in hand with um, the technology advancement. So while those barriers exist in, you know, in the UN, in the world of the US, there are even greater barriers for Africa. So now I'm bringing it back to, you know, buildings in Africa. So the focus, to be quite frank, for, um, you know, Africa is power generation. You know, Sub-Sahara is home to more than 1 billion people. Um, and then although we just, we, you know, at, and they produce just 0.6% of the cumulative global carbon dioxide emission, um, it, it is, the population is still a growing population. Um, so we still, you know, ignoring it is not, you know, the, the answer. However, these barriers still exist and, you know, governments are now focused about, you know, power generation and economic development and bringing their people out of poverty. Um, and we still, you know, we're talking about power reduction, but there's still about 600 million people that still live without uh, power. Um, international investment, you know, uh, investment promised by the Paris Agreement, they were still, you know, African countries are not receiving that fund. Uh, lack of supporting government policies, again, because it's not a priority, 
you know, it's not there. Um, and then existing infrastructure has already deteriorated from transformers to grid lines. All of those need to be upgraded before we think about net zero. And so anytime, you know, we talk about energy in development country, the concept of leapfrogging is uh, thrown out. What exactly is leapfrogging? It is the ability of developing or less developed countries to essentially skip, um, you know, what developed countries have done and get to, you know, the, uh, you know, more efficient, the renewable energy, all of those solutions that, you know, help us meet the net zero energy. However, again, like I mentioned, all of those um, aspects is, require large investment um, and a government that's focused on you know, these matters. So to, in conclusion, um, to be able to drive the change in Africa alone, the demographic is shifting, which is about we are adding, we will be adding about one, I say we because I am originally Ethiopian, although I reside in the US. So uh, please excuse that, uh, the demographic shift. So we will be adding about 1 billion people by 2050. So that's a lot of people that need you know, power, right? So that's a lot of electrification that needs to happen before we even think about net zero. Um, and then urbanization, half a billion people are becoming a part of Africa's urban population by 2040. Uh, these demographic population shifts will have significant implication on um, energy demand, transportation, industry, cooling, heating, all of those. And every African, like any other developed country, uh, will like you know their cell phones charged, their TVs on, light whenever we need it. All those things need to uh, be balanced. Along with that, if we are able to have you know African-friendly technology advancement, and I specifically put African-friendly because this um, one solution for all does not necessarily work uh, for us. We need you know, solutions tailored for Africa. Um, and then in the international investment, those the funds that were promised need to be delivered. So governments can focus and be able to invest in energy efficiency as well as renewable energy. And then before that happens, we need stable governments with, you know, that, have, that make deep commitments and put programs and policies to help, you know, get us to net zero. Thank you again. My name is Salome Girma and this is my information. Great, thank you, thank you for that, um, Salome. Um, I think there was quite a, a striking um, stat there that you had of fifty to seventy percent reduction in uh, energy. Is that something that is being achieved within that net zero uh, program? Because I think what's what's important for us now today is to understand what what is being achieved. Yeah, well, so and the if the targets are fifty to seventy percent. Mm -hmm. Yes, so you basically yeah. have to reduce your energy unit in the index UI per yes. square footage to make sure um, that you get to this um, figure, basically to the fifty to seventy percent. And my colleagues, yes, but within the project. within the projects that within the projects that have been verified, is mm -hmm. that energy use intensity being being achieved before the Absolutely. renewable offset? Okay. Yes, I think that's something that. And you'll see more details from that's something that, um, fellow panelists. That's some, yeah, yeah. And I think that's something for all of us to keep in mind because we're trying to figure out whether or not this is possible. And the efficiency first approach where we have to reduce significantly, and this is a 50 to 70% reduction on a performance that was already um, probably a bit more efficient due to the energy code that is in there. Um, We'll quickly go on to uh, Smita to uh, present to present next. Sure. I am setting up my slides here. Just give me one second. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Great. Yes, we can see it. Okay. Great. Excellent. So thank you, Salome, for that interesting presentation. Um, and let me put this out into the universe that it's Salome's dream to work on development in Africa. So in case anybody is listening to that. <clears throat> thank you for the shout out. It's a shout out for Salome. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. 
uh, Dennis, Cyril, and Chilu. Thanks to all the participants for tuning in. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today. A little bit about me. My name is Smita Chandra Thomas. I'm the founder and principal of a US-based consulting practice called Energy Shrink. Uh, we work with both the private sector and the public sector, including the US Department of Energy, the DC Public Service Commission. I also consult to IFC, uh, which is a member of the World Bank Group on the EDGE Green Buildings Program. That's how I know Dennis and Chilu, who often emails me about his EDGE projects. Um, I have a master's in building science from the University of California. Uh, UCLA and Berkeley, and I've worked in the US since 1997, first at a Department of Energy lab for two years, and then in the private sector since 1999. Uh, in the coming months, I'll also be teaching a course on decarbonizing buildings at the George Washington University in DC. So uh, today we are talking about, you know, is net zero a fad? Uh, so through my presentation, I'd like to share with you that really it's the only way forward. And it makes a lot of sense from many points of view. Uh, besides climate change, it's great for thermal comfort and the financial bottom line. So let me dive in. There is a strong business case for green buildings in emerging economies. Buildings consume large amounts of energy. The demand for new buildings, especially housing, is booming in the emerging economies. And the utility costs for both residential and commercial sectors is very high. So when we build green, we hit all of these aspects. Let's look at a couple of examples. In Kumasi, Ghana, the EDGE certified green mother and child unit in this hospital is now able to divert the money that it's saving on utilities into better facilities for mother and children. This actually helps to save the, uh, these utility costs and these improved facilities are reducing the mortality rate among newborns and mothers. Like I mentioned, this is an IFC EDGE project. Now this one is a housing project. Thanks to living in a certified green building, a low income resident in this affordable housing development in South Africa is able to save the equivalent of one month's rent. This image is of a US lab and it was built as the same cost as a regular commercial building, actually a little cheaper. So average class A buildings come in at about $300 a square foot in the US. And this was built for about $260 a square foot. It's a beautiful modern building with lots of daylight, lighting controls and mechanized shading. This is in a mild climate, which would be similar to Accra. With all the good passive design features, the design team was able to completely avoid putting in a cooling system. And this building achieved LEED Platinum certification. On this image on the right is the first zero carbon community in London. It's called Bed Z. It uses natural ventilation to lower its cooling requirements. On the left are more examples of natural ventilation. This building in Austria has no cooling or heating. This cold climate building has thick walls, really thick walls, and windows that are right sized. Note that all these high performance buildings, none of them are glass boxes. So glass boxes were very popular in the 20th century, but they do not belong in the 21st century. Please do not build glass boxes. Passive design can be beautiful and it saves money. This DC lab came in 17% under budget because it was designed with high performance glass and shading and with that, it was able to save money on its HVAC and controls. What if we don't do anything? We are in a climate crisis and I'm not going to go into each of these issues that we are about to face uh, against which we must be resilient. So every building that we build and retrofit is helping us fight against these climate impacts. 
the countries you know, all across the world have pledged to reduce buildings emissions. And we have um, the COP26 that is just coming up. Let's see what we pledge afresh in the coming days. But there is a lot uh, happening that we must meet the requirements of. Buildings are the largest users of global energy. And the largest source of global emissions from fossil fuels. I'm sure a lot of you know this already, but it's worth remembering why what we are doing is so important. US building energy is mostly produced from fossil fuels. And this is true almost everywhere in the world still. And we are still continuing to build coal plants, which is unconscionable you know, in, in this day and age when we are fighting climate change. In the US, what we have found is that GDP and energy use have been decoupled. This is true in almost all advanced economies. As the GDP is going up, the energy use is going down. The idea is that we can do more using less. Even in China, this is true today. So we must be mindful that energy efficiency can help and we can do more with less. Africa is one of the fastest growing regions. This, it's going to see a boom in its growth in the coming decades. So it becomes really important for new construction to be very mindful of the fact that the building sector has the most potential for reduction in emissions. Yes, it is true that transportation and industry also have a lot of emissions, but building sector is the sector where we have the technology today to get to net zero, we have the technology today to reduce our emissions. And we can do this across a range of uh, GHE, that is greenhouse gas abatement actions. This is a very famous figure. It's called the McKenzie cost abatement curve. You may have, many of you may have seen it because this is all the way from 2009 and it hasn't been updated in the last 20 years because it's, it's still, uh, you know, it's still valid today. It shows that many of these measures uh, for cleaner power cost some money. That's why they are on the positive axis, but they can have a lot of impact. But on the negative, I think we lost Smitha a little bit there. Are you back, Smitha? I am here. Are you able to see my screen? No, we can't see it anymore. Yeah, it kind of kicked me out. Okay, let me try again. Do you see it? Yep. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so we were talking about the cost abatement curve. So the point uh, of the study was to show that you can do a lot in buildings at negative cost because you're actually saving money by doing them. So moving on to the next slide, green buildings are also a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. This is from an investment point of view, uh, a study put out by IFC that shows that, you know, IFC is an impact investor and it is focused on developing economies it has shown that these can be really profitable investments. Embodied emissions are another area that are becoming increasingly important. As your building operations costs are going down, embodied emissions are becoming important. That is the emissions that come from the materials that go into the buildings. So as you're thinking about building operations, also think about what you're using to build your buildings. And here I'd really like to stress that in the last 50 years, we've kind of lost sight of where we are with our buildings. Before the invention of central air conditioning, central heating and cooling, all over the world, we used to have local building technologies that would help us live comfortably in the local climate. Now that we have air conditioning, 
we are starting to just throw in an air conditioning system and put in a glass box. And it makes zero sense. Really, it makes zero sense. So we need to learn from our history and try to think about what makes sense in our country, wherever we are located, so that we can reduce our dependence on heating and cooling systems that are fired by fossil fuels. This is another uh, point I'd really like to share. Uh, Salome defined what net zero buildings are, but I'd like to really stress that all net zero buildings are not equal. So in this slide, you see three figures. All of them are net zero buildings. And what we mean by that is that the amount of energy they consume, they are making up for that amount of energy with solar panels. That is technically the definition of net zero. However, these three buildings are different from each other. The first building is consuming 150 kW, that's its you know, demand on site, of which 100 is being supplied from the grid and 50 is coming from the solar panels. This building has a giant appetite. Next to that is a building that has been designed much better. It has less glass, it has more shading, and it has half the appetite and therefore it draws half the power from the grid and it needs half a solar panel system is also halved. So we have to remember that even though we may be balancing what we are producing on the grid and on the solar panels, what is being produced on the grid is already emitting emissions and going out into the atmosphere. So whatever you produce on your solar panels, even though it may be net zero because it's canceling out what you pull from the grid, the emissions from the grid are still going into the air. And once they're in the air, they stay in the air for hundreds of years, right? So if you want to really clean up the atmosphere, we have to stop pulling so much from the grid. So the last figure here is showing a building that is not getting anything from the grid because it has the, all of its energy coming from clean energy. So really the goal for all of us should not be net zero. The goal for all of us should be zero use of fossil fuels because that's what creates emissions. We need energy to live, we need energy to work, but we do not want to get it from fossil fuels. That's the goal. Uh, this is a little bit on the net zero building process. And Alexi from NBI is going to probably talk more about it. So I won't spend a lot of time on this, but this image is actually from NBI who are one of the leaders in how to build for net zero. Uh, I'll just say very quickly that the idea is to first say, I'm going to lower my energy use on site. That's the number one step. And then you think about how you're going to do that, whether you do that through performance-based contracts or using energy modeling, applying energy conservation measures. You just wanna keep reducing your energy use before you think about going to um, your solar panels and storage. So what you see here is what we at Energy Shrink call the pare down framework. You know, if you, if you imagine it, it's like taking a piece of wood and whittling it down. So we say, you know, you start by minimizing your building loads. That is, you use passive design techniques to minimize as much as possible the loads that your building is going to put on your building systems. Once you have these smaller loads that are going to the building systems, you then have a smaller building system to invest in. And you have to make that system as efficient as possible, which means you right size it. You don't use the typical HVAC, you know, mechanical engineer thinking of, oh, let's make it two times or three times as a safety factor. No, because that makes your mechanical system cycle a lot. And of course, you're paying more out of pocket to begin with. But then all the cycling wear and tear actually reduces the life of your mechanical system. So you want to right size it. You want to utilize ground heat. You want to maximize your system efficiency on uh, and lighting and equipment. Now with all of that, then you use your advanced controls. And then 
with this whittle down building that has a much smaller need, you put in a smaller, you know, renewable energy system, and then you support it with storage <clears throat> and a clean grid if possible to have a much smaller footprint for your building. Now, this is an impact analysis we did for a sample building in DC. Uh, in blue, you see the baseline building, and in gray, you see the integrated case, which is using a bunch of uh, efficiency measures. I'll just highlight the bottom line here. So you see, at the bottom, you see that we have reduced, and this is only a model, of course, but the models are you know, not that far from reality, uh, if you do them well. Uh, here, the EUI we are showing is 80% energy savings you can get on your building even before you have started thinking about your solar panels. Now, um, Smita, just being mindful of time and a couple of questions that have come through um, for you. Um, do you mind if we go um, if we go to to ask you some ask some questions quickly? Because we are yeah, um, just mindful we've got two more. Sure. You have I'm a actually lot of almost at the end. This is my second last slide. So I'm just going to close now. Just give me a minute here. So, uh, you know, sure. what we are showing with this building is that your HVAC system costs are going to come down. You're going to save hundreds of thousands of dollars on HVAC and millions on your PV system. So essentially, the idea is that this money that you save on your HVAC and PV, when you think about it in an integrated fashion, you can put that into your building, in your thermal comfort, your uh, insulation, and save money that way. So in closing, I'd just like to say that, you know, the green building design process is ripe for innovation. And um, <clears throat> I welcome your questions. Um, Smita, I think when, um, when, uh, the kind of like some parallels from Salome's one, which is, you know, you're reducing 50 to 70% energy. And then a lot of the examples you had um, talked about no, no HVAC at all, which is quite a big um, mind shift for, for, for people to think, you know, uh, that, that, that you, you have to design a building with, um, with no HVAC. And one of the, the issues, the other issue you raised of, of glass boxes, you know? So I think with net zero, you almost have to be able to look at a building and then say, you'll never achieve it. And do you have any experience with that aspect with clients and project teams to say that we actually have to go and we have to drop 60% of the glass on this on this building? So um, until I'll keep my answer short because I'm very aware that Pauline and, you know, Alexi haven't spoken yet. Uh, but in 2007, this was a long time ago, we were asked by EPA to, uh, you know, this very question, like, is it even possible to get to net zero? And like Salome also mentioned, uh, we found that if we took a large office building, this is not a school, which is actually easier to work with. We took a large office building across all climate zones in the US, and we have a large variety. We were able to show that for new construction, you can get to net zero in any climate, even for a large office building. And we see this like all around me, uh, where I sit near in DC, we have many schools. Uh, typically that's where the money is. People are able to, um, you know, see the results there. We have schools that are coming in at, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to use BTUs because that's what we are familiar with here, but they're coming in at under 20 BTUs per square foot multiple schools, and then they have these solar systems which make them net zero. So yes, it is very possible. And I think NBI has a great database on many buildings that have achieved net zero. I'll well, thank there. you. Um, Pauline, I know you've done a lot of research on, on green buildings in, in Ghana. And you know, as an industry that is sort of starting out, it's still relatively new. And now we're discussing a building that is going to now be 50 to 70% better than what we would consider already a, a green building. Um, I think it would be interesting to hear your take now on, on this new goal and how feasible and the, the, the business case for green buildings 
before we started to talk about net zero and and now that we're talking about buildings that are going to be surpass the ones that you've already sort of um, been researching. Okay, thank you, Mr. Longe. Thank you, Smeta. Thank you, um, Solomon, for your wonderful presentation. I think you put um, everything much into context for me to come in. And um, what I'm going to talk about is very Ghana specific and um, because it's Ghana Green Building Summit. And it is based on a research that I have already, I, I, I completed in July, looking at the, um, having listened to the importance of green buildings, the question is, uh, property values impacted by green features? And if so, does it incentivize people in Ghana to invest in green buildings? And uh, I'll give a little bit of context before I go into the details. Um, but we've already heard about the menace of climate change and how it's causing, we saw from Smith's presentation about the, 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 the uh, for, um, bushfires, it causes the flood, it, it, it causes a lot of food insecurity, it increases the um, uh, incidence of poverty in Africa especially. And the Africa Development Bank has actually stated that about seven out of 10 countries in the world that are most impacted by climate change are found in Africa. So. African countries must be very, very interested in this whole um, climate change agenda and to look at the various options available to them in mitigating them. And I work in um, energy and extractives. And so sorry, I've not introduced myself. I, I, I'll probably do that in the course of time. But um, my work has been in energy and extractives. Um, I, I have worked at the Africa Center for Energy Policy, heading the policy unit and doing research and policy analysis to influence policies in the energy sector, including issues on climate change. I am currently an external advisor to the EU Negative Emissions Project, comprising of 16 um, um, a member, it's a 16 member consortium, um, you know, looking at new technologies that could improve negative emissions. Um, um, then, and then I'm also on um, um, the, so I'm part of, a group of experts for the Oxford Climate Alumni Network. So basically, there is a brief about me. Um, now, when we come to Africa, as I mentioned, this whole green building is very important to us because of the potential impacts of climate change on our economies. And achieving net zero is very important because as we've heard already, it reduces cost. Um, we know that in 2019, about 28% of global energy emissions came from buildings. And we also know that a lot of people live in buildings and most of these buildings are, are built from cement and the manufacturing processes um, for cement has very grave emission impact. Um, cement factories use huge fossil fuel and also the transformation of limestone causes emission. So we need to be serious about uh, moving away from the traditional forms of buildings. Now in Ghana, in Ghana, the cost of energy is about 35% of total operational costs for hotels. And it is the same, it's also high for office buildings. And, uh, and so for me, the research I did was to look at how um, individuals and companies are interested in investing in green buildings, considering the potential benefits that it brings. Um, and I find that the, the key finding is that in Ghana, there is a link between green buildings and property values. But then the, that link or the realization of that value is not possible in the present, in, in our present situation. It is very much possible in the future. Let's say in 15 to 20 years time. For now, we cannot realize that uh, value. And the reason is that first, people do not have knowledge about the importance of green buildings. The awareness is very low and people are, comfortable with the, the building methods that they, that exist now. And nobody or not many people are taking steps to realize the importance of green buildings for the environment, for their bottom lines, and, and also for their businesses. And so because of that lack of awareness, not many people are investing. And for those people that are even investing, the problem is that it is very expensive. It is expensive to build. The, the UK Green Building Council has estimated that Building green office buildings um, um, cost about 6.2% uh, more 
than building traditional or normal buildings that we know. And this has been established in literature, the number of research that's, that stays the same. And we've seen that in the presentations from the, the earlier presenters. There's also the high investment cost. In Ghana here, it is difficult to get um, um, cheap financing for green buildings. So it, because it is expensive, and people need uh, funding from the banks. It is also difficult to get funding because of high interest rates. And the market is also not very matured. You barely see green buildings around. There are a few dotted here and there, especially in Accra, but there's, there's not much case studies to prove to people the potential benefits green buildings can bring to property values. So that lack of data in itself prevents the promotion of uh, the uh, green buildings. So the question is how, uh, so for me, the, the next question was how do we move away from, you know, talking about the challenges and um, realizing the benefits. Um, most of the people I interviewed were very clear that awareness creation is very important. And what we are doing today fits into the whole awareness creation agenda. And the other most important thing people talked about is the need to demonstrate the economic benefits of green buildings. I looked up um, the green buildings elsewhere in the UK, in the US, showing the uh, potential benefits that it brings. I mean, the actual benefits these green buildings are realizing. And um, <clears throat> these are Western markets, but we are in frontier. In the, uh, we, I, I can't even describe our market in Ghana the real estate markets for green buildings as frontier because it's, it's very, it's, the concept is very new and many people are now hearing about it and getting used to it. So if you look at the Siemens, uh, Siemens Crystal building in London, the building was, uh, the, the green building was built in 2012 at a cost of 30 million euros, uh, 30 million pounds. And the building generates 20% of electricity from solar. And then um, the 70% of light that comes to the building is natural. And the, the, the savings on carbon emissions is 71%. And there is the, the estimate, this estimated that um, about 500,000 pounds is saved every year in energy savings. So imagine a building that was built in 2012 for 30 million, um, yielding some benefits, savings of 500,000 pounds per annum on energy savings. There's a similar building, um, one embankment owned by PricewaterhouseCoopers in London. It's also retrofitted. So it was an old building, 1990, retrofitted into a, a net zero building. It has roof gardens. Um, it is fueled by recycled waste vegetable oil. So not the normal fuel we, we are talking about. And it, it also has open plant spaces. Um, it has roof gardens and green walls. and that building emits 40%. It's, um, sort of, we're going to go to a place where we're starting out and we have to really you know, jump over the, the, the slightly less um, efficient buildings. Um, just, we, we still have Alexi. More, there's one more thing I need to say, which has to do with interventions about policy and setting standards. It is something that is very critical to do in Ghana. I know it's, it's been started, IFC has led it. Um, there's now a revision of the building code. Now it has to be passed into law and that is where the hurdle is. So governments, where policy goes, you know, businesses follow. So when government is uh, very proactive on regulation, um, the green building agenda would, would, would uh, improve in Ghana. So that's the bit I wanted to add. Yeah, I think that's that's a, an important uh, item and a good segue into Alex's um, data and, and and experience because they're obviously tracking all the um, the buildings that are actually achieving net zero. So I think we it's very important for us to sort of hear from him and see the the real world data that's been um, that's been collected. Um, even though we are pressed for time, so Alexi, um, I know you you know you had a couple of. Um, really nice images where you could show us that, you know, this energy use intensity is being achieved across all the buildings and it's a, it's a common thread. 
Um, so while and while you pull that up, um, we'll let you just quickly go through the some of the more salient aspects so that we can still have a discussion. Um, and I'll be remiss if I don't mention the fact that I'm actually sitting in a in a net zero office. Our office is uh, we're actually off grid, so um, it is completely uh, possible, and it's it's really something that we should be uh, going to and. Just before you start as well, Alexi, um, within this, within your presentation, if we could also just hear the role that legislation has had on this, because obviously, you know, your your base is of an energy efficiency, um, of an of a different energy efficiency baseline, whereas we're starting where most of our market doesn't have any the building codes or anything that is going to drive the baseline energy efficiency, which makes data and all of that a bit more difficult. Cool. Sure. And, and as I go to, I, I want to be aware of time, you know, it's, uh, we're getting toward the scheduled end. So do you want me to go through the whole session or, or would you prefer I, I hit some highlights? You can also flag me when you think I'm about halfway through the time you would like me to take and I'll, I'll close it out from there. You know, I, I really like the slide where you've got what is being achieved, you know, because yeah. we're trying to answer this question around, um, is this thing a fad? And you've sure. got the data that says, no, it's being achieved. And I think there's always this aspect of like, if something is coming from, from a different market and we'd be like, well, it's possible there, but maybe not here. And I think a lot of your data tells us that conditions are similar. And in most African countries, we have better climatic conditions actually. So right. it, it should be possible. Well, let me, uh, let me put some buildings on the map quite literally. So thanks for having me. I'm Alexi Miller, <clears throat> Associate Technical Director with New Buildings Institute. We're a nonprofit organization based in the USA. We work across the US and, and to a smaller extent internationally, um, including on codes and policies. So as you, as you mentioned, uh, you know, building energy codes, we, a few years back, we wrote the, the building code for Fiji, for example. Uh, but uh, in any case, one of the things that, one of the projects I manage at New Buildings Institute is I keep track of all of the net zero energy and zero carbon and carbon neutral buildings across North America. So we have a database, it's called the Getting to Zero Buildings Database, online accessible, I'll, I'll have a link in a moment, um, where we track those buildings. And, and what we've seen over the about 10 years since we started uh, tracking this industry, so we've seen about a 12-fold increase in the, the count of buildings across North America that are either achieving zero energy performance, in which they, you know, they, they uh, produce uh, as much energy as they consume over a year, or they're emerging to that level. And so this, this chart here on the right shows the blue buildings are trying to get there. Maybe I personally have not seen their data. They may have made it to zero uh, but but I don't know that, or they're still striving for that goal. Um, and then the green ones show projects we know they really did get there. Um, and as Chilo mentioned, they're all across uh, across the country and across uh, other regions. They are also all across the world. I just don't personally have the bandwidth to uh, to track the entire world worth of net zero buildings. So my map is only North America. So apologies for that. But but I know that this this is not a fad here at home where I live and nor is it a fad in many other parts of the world. Um, it's eminently achievable and, and each dot on the map here represents one or in some cases towns with 20 or more uh, net zero buildings <clears throat> that are actually on the map. Uh, the US is a very climactically diverse country and the, there are net zero energy buildings in every climate zone across North America from deserts to cold mountains, including hot and humid regions. Uh, there are net zero buildings in every major building type. This map just shows commercial and multifamily buildings, uh, but there are single family homes all the way up to very large office buildings. Uh, and, and indeed, you know, industrial or institutional like laboratory as well. Um, I wanna briefly mention, we've heard from a couple of folks already today that uh, net zero energy, is quite critical and and I consider these we at MBI I consider these to be the five foundations of getting to a net zero carbon building or a carbon neutral building since after all we as a, a world are not terribly concerned about running out of energy there's a lot of oil coal gas 
as well as renewable energy potential. There's plenty of energy in the world. The problem is what happens if we use all that energy? Uh, that's the cost, the environmental implications of consuming all that energy uh, and producing, delivering, et cetera. So uh, these foundations, I think, make it clear. The first two, energy efficiency and renewable energy. Zero energy buildings as, as currently conceived generally focus on those two. Be very efficient, efficiency first, that's where it should be as the foundation, and then offset with renewable energy to get to zero. Um, the point I'd like to make is that, that if we really care about uh, solving the climate crisis, we need to consider some other foundations as well. Building grid integration, storage, uh, electric vehicles and resiliency considerations, electrification so that we stop burning fossil fuels in buildings and the life cycle impacts the embodied carbon of those. So very brief note on, on each of these um, and Chilo, feel free to, to pop up if, uh, if I should be either skipping some sections or, or, or moving along. Um, <clears throat> so that database, all those dots on the map, I'll scroll back up to this. What we did here is we took all of these buildings for those we actually know the energy consumption and production for the buildings. Uh, and we, we put them, put all that data into one set. This is the energy use intensity. I've converted it to metric units uh, of all of the net zero buildings for which we do know the data uh, across North America, commercial and multifamily. And what this shows us is uh, basically they're taking an efficiency first approach. Um, the median energy use intensity for verified net zero buildings is about 60 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Um, and for the emerging, it's slightly higher. Both of those are really good targets. Uh, the, in, in KBTU per square foot per year in these silly imperial units we seem to be stuck with here in the US, uh, it's about 20 to 22 KBTU per square foot per year. For reference, a code level building using the most up-to-date, highly efficient uh, energy code, the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code. It's called international, it's really mostly here in the US. Uh, that comes in at about 145 or so kilowatt hours per square meter per year. So these buildings are using less than half of the baseline of even a very modern, stringent, high-performance code. Um, and you saw in, in Smith's presentation that there are real cost implications of doing that. If you invest a bit more in the envelope and, and in passive systems, then you can use that savings to offset, uh, or rather, then you get savings. You don't have to invest in large cooling systems, other mechanical systems. And if you're trying to get to zero, you have these vast savings on PV. You don't need nearly as much renewable energy. I think just uh, on, on, that, um, on that image, I think what is really important around the energy efficiency, so because we have to try and wrap it up but i think this is a really great context because that medium uh median actually represents sort of three to four times less energy use than a typical building in south africa for example and that's a huge opportunity and i think that's a, a lot of what we need to take away from this is that it's mm -hmm. possible but it's going to be like nothing you've ever done before when we work on net zero buildings, we always tell people that it's not going to be the same. You know, you are not going to come out with what you did previously. You'll be challenged. Yeah, and we've found with a lot of design teams in both new construction and existing building renovations that setting an aggressive target early is absolutely critical. So you might say you've got a new, say you've got a new building project coming up, um, and you want to leapfrog, you want to say, we don't need to do what we're used to doing. Let's not go half measures. Um, let's set an aggressive energy target early, get the whole team on board from the owner to the designer to the builder. Uh, and with that target in mind early, then you can do things like shift your investment from mechanical systems to envelope, you know, building shell, windows, et cetera. If you're able to do that, which is enabled, those kinds of strategies are enabled by setting the target early and getting everyone an understanding that and on the same page, uh, then the cost premium does not need to be very high. Um, we've looked into the cost premium of, of net zero energy buildings and we've found it's, it varies from maybe 
negative 10% to positive 10% with an average or a median somewhere around about a 2% increase in total cost. But in many cases, the net zero building costs less. And that's often driven by the fact that you don't need to buy such a, a large mechanical system, right? In some of these cases, there simply is no chiller or it's very small. Um, and so a key piece is, is setting an aggressive goal early and getting the whole team on board. So this, this graphic gives you an idea where that goal might be. Yeah. And so if we're trying to answer those questions, uh, and that maybe can be the way we can try and, and, and wrap it up, because I know someone in Accra is jumping up and down. Um, so if we say our net zero buildings are fad, we can just quickly have a close out answer from everyone, yes or no, maybe, or uh, from, from the panel, not from the remaining 96 participants. <laughs> but the remaining 96 participants can maybe answer in the chat. Maybe we can do that. We can finish off that way. If everybody that is a participant that's still here, can you just say yes, no, or maybe about whether or not uh, net zero is possible? And we'll get Cyril to email a poll to see what everybody said. Um, cool, so I'll just check it in the order that I'm looking at people here. So Pauline, uh, Salome, Alexi, and then Smita. Yes, no, maybe. Okay, so it, it's a fad depending on the context. So if it is an African context where as Alexi says, the cost is uh, between, it's, it's relative, it's not much, but in our context, it's a different question altogether. So depending on the context, it could be a fact. Is it a no? Okay, there's a yes. Okay. I think we'll leave everybody's answers to the, um, to the, to the, um, panel there on the side. If it would be great if everybody could rename themselves because it looks like David or Poku is the only person that's giving us uh, answers. Cool. So to the panelists, thank you very much. Um, it was great to, to meet everyone. Um, from my side, I think we'll definitely be connecting with, with everyone again. Um, and then back to Accra. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Bye-bye everyone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if I'm heard loud and clear, then we're just about in the closing phase. And thank you all for a very good session you just took us through. Um, as to whether it's a fad or not, I uh, would leave that to people to give in their answers and their inputs and all that. But for now, I'd like to bring on the head of um, IFC's Green Building unit who is responsible for Ghana, Kenya, and Nigeria. Uh, that's Dennis Papa Odenye Kwanza. So Dennis, if you're there, I'll kindly ask you to please come back on and give the official closing remarks after which I'll give, I'll just give a few announcements and uh, we'll be done for this year's 2021 Ghana Green Building Summit. So Dennis, uh, please take it away. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, so I believe you all had a very exciting summit. Um, personally, I learned a lot um, over the past two days, and I'm sure most of us also have. And I'm hoping that this will go a long way to change our mindset on green buildings um, in Ghana. And I also believe that the summit has been able to help demystify some of the uh, notions and misconceptions that we had on green buildings. Um, I, I, I'm sure that we have broadened our knowledge on, um, I mean, energy materials and then water efficiency measures in buildings. Um, we've also gotten to know about interior designs and the material selections. And then we've also um, learned about the various green finance options out there in the markets. So I'm very sure um, that um, those that thought green building was impossible in Ghana, I mean, may have a change in mind and then know that, well, after all, um, if we do certain things differently, we may see um, different results. Um, I mean, we at IFC are helping to um, push this. Um, we do have our Edge Green Building Program, which is um, a great fit, uh, bringing all the stakeholders together and then also providing uh, the opportunity for financing to come in. Um, I'm happy, I mean, I recommend, I'm sorry, I, I commend um, HM Consult for doing this. Um, we would continue to support the events. And uh, we also thank all the other sponsors that 
came on board to help support this initiative. We hope that next year, when we come calling, um, you would still be happy to support it. And um, next year, when we meet, um, hopefully we should be talking about some real achievements. Um, we shouldn't be talking about any, anything theoretical. We should have some stuff on the ground. Uh, we should be able to hear Cow Bank and Assets Bank uh, come to tell us about the number of projects that they've provided the uh, green financing to. Uh, we should see other financial institutions also coming up with uh, more green financing products. Um, it will be great to hear about the experience of um, some of the local developers who have accessed green finance from these FIs or even gone ahead to raise funding from the capital markets. Um, it would also be great to um, see I mean, it would be great for us to talk about um, new projects that have been green certified. Um, and then also, hopefully, we should be celebrating our first Net Zero project in Ghana. Um, so all of these are stuff that um, we are hoping we can do within the next one year. Let's, let's continue to keep the discussion ongoing. It shouldn't be just a two-day affair. Um, we should continue um, discussing green building. We should look at how we can improve the situation. Um, in our uh, daily work. Thank you, and um, we are grateful for all of you joining, mean, taking the time to join us and then uh, making this a success. Thanks. Well, thank you very Over much. You, yes, thank you very much, Danis. Um, so Danis represents the EDGE program at the IFC, and we are grateful for that partnership with the program. Um, <laughs> also, we thank our partners from SECO, from the Swiss uh, confederation. Um, we are grateful for all the great efforts that you have put in. Then as well, uh, to Sintak, uh, to the Danish embassy, thank you very much for all your efforts as well. Um, Karl Bank um, has also been an amazing partner. And uh, like they say, a, a picture or video gives you a thousand words. So whilst I'm saying thank you, I just want to pan out to the Karl Bank um, carport where you can see an amazing display of solar that's on the rooftop and it shows you something interesting. So I just want you to see out there for yourself that this is right here in Ghana in Accra and the Cow Bank head office has this amazing uh, solar carport. Um, we want to also encourage others who do not have it like you can see on the roof uh, that's on the far right um, that they can also turn their roof spaces into solar ports. So I would want to say thank you also to the Cow Bank team. And this is coming live from Accra as we are uh, projecting uh, to the global world. So back to the partners again, I'd want to thank Access Bank for the great work that they have also done. I'd like to thank uh, the Ghana Institution of Engineering. I'd like to thank the Green Building, the Ghana Green Building Council, the Ghana Institute of Planners, the Ghana Institute of Architectures, uh, Architects, um, and Ernest and Young, EY. I'd like to thank the Renewable Energy Association of Ghana. I'd like to thank Green Carpet 21, Echo Amet Solutions, Gonfos, Ghana Institution of Surveyors, and definitely our media partners as well, um, Joy FM, Joy News, Ghana Web, BNFT, GTV, and Mikasa.com. We've all been amazing partners and sponsors to this year's event. What you should be assured of is, it's not going to be talk, it's going to be more action as well. And so there's a lot of commitments that have been made by the partners and by different stakeholders. I'd want to encourage you to say that from wherever you are, in that little corner that you might be, please make sure you're taking some right steps because as you've been made aware, there's a lot of financing also out there. There's a lot of education that should go on. There's a lot of actions that need to be taken. We cannot just be um, going on and on about green and not taking action. So like Dana said earlier as well, and I'm retracing and like many others have said, let's come back next year, having convinced ourselves that we have taken actions, but to also demonstrate them just like we did right now with a pan around the, car, the carport of uh, Cow Bank, you can see there are different actions. I know people are doing amazing things. Sometimes, like we said, there's a lot of knowledge sharing that has not happened, but we would want to see a lot more of that happening. So on behalf of the key organizers, Yechem Properties, and on behalf of the team, 
Um, Enoch Yeboye Pong here. I'm saying thank you to everyone globally. To Sintak, uh, Maxi Boku, um, what else do I have to say to say thank you? God richly bless you and please make sure that you're keeping safe. Cheers and bye from Accra, Ghana.